True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. The woman smiles provocatively at the man as he pulls his car up on the side of the road. He rolls his window down and she leans in. After a few minutes, they settle on a deal and the woman gets in the car. Before she does, she glances over her shoulder at a friend standing nearby. Their eyes connect in an unspoken exchange. If I don't come back, look for me. It will be the last time they exchange that look, because as the car pulls off and is swallowed up by the darkness, the woman is in mortal danger and she will not know this until it's too late. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 84, The Serial Crimes of Bride and Brunt. This week's True Crime TV must-watch is the premiere of the brand new CBS Justice original series, Descent of a Serial Killer. Could evidence-based profiling change the deadly path of some killers? Don't miss former FBI agents and leading criminologist Dr. Brianna Fox as she examines the killer's path, from the first appearance of worrying traits in their early years to the gradual disintegration of personal morality. Only on DSTV 170 from Sunday the 3rd of July at 7pm. A huge thank you to CBS Justice for sponsoring this episode of True Crime South Africa. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Chris Hill, Shakti Jainaran, Estelle Alcor, Chanel Willemsa, Marilee Fandamava, Amai Moana, Nabo Granger, Pumla Sibanyoni, Kate Webb, Kim Norton, and Michelle Petey. Thank you so much for your support, everyone. It really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. In addition to the shout out and monthly exclusive episodes that Patreons get, I also now upload an ad-free version of every week's episode to Patreon, so if you prefer not to hear the ads, head over to Patreon and sign up for a minimum monthly contribution of just $1, which at the moment is about 16 Rand. It's a pretty good deal. If you like discounts, who doesn't? Head over to King Online for your health and beauty needs, print crowd for all your printing requirements, and use the code TCSA10 at checkout for a 10% discount and support the show at the same time. And you can also get 10% off when you order from Wallpaper Online by using the code TRUECRIME at checkout. Other forms of support that make a huge difference include following the show on social media, inviting your friends, family, postman, hairdresser and parole officer to listen, and leaving reviews on the podcast platform you use. Today's episode is about a serial murderer. But rather than the usual highly charged string of murders where the offender seems incapable of stopping themselves, this offender sort of drifted from one murder to the next. He was one of those offenders who specifically selected a vulnerable sector of society to target and it helped him get away with his crimes for far too long. There's another aspect of this case that feels familiar to many serial offenders, though, and that's what the offender claimed happened in his past. My sources for this episode include Mickey Pistorius' book Strangers on the Street, as well as Gerard Labaskakny's academic study on foreign object insertion in serial murders. So let's get into... Episode 84, The Serial Crimes of Bryden Brunt. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. 
If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counseling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Bryden Brunts was born on the 15th of April 1964 in Valcom. It's often difficult when we look at the histories of offenders who would go on to become serial murderers to determine which statements about their childhood and upbringing are actually factual and which are creations of their own minds in an attempt to garner a reduced sentence. Of course, when childhood trauma is presented in a sentencing phase as mitigation, there needs to be some form of proof of that. Psychosocial reports by social workers, as well as psychological assessments from psychologists and psychiatrists, can be presented, which may add some credence to the claims. But essentially, for us to know that this is the truth, it would need to be backed up by a family member of the offender. And even if that happens, one of two things may also be true. Either a family member may deny true claims because the nature of the claim reflects badly on them, or they may support false claims because they want the offender to be given mitigation in sentence. The other thing about any testimony a serial offender provides is that these people are so often living with personality disorders, which can include some level of psychopathic traits, that often, for them, the truth is a rare commodity, to be avoided at all costs, and the story they want to present is one that makes them look good and helps them to manipulate those around them and the system. So it is with this view that I approach every story of childhood abuse that's presented by an offender. I'm always one to first believe the victim until the story is proven incorrect by evidence, but in these cases, I can't help but be sceptical. With that said, we do know that many violent offenders, both sexual and otherwise, have some history of abuse within their childhoods. Sadly, sexual violation at a young age, when combined with other factors, can turn a victim into a perpetrator. Most often, abuse victims do not go on to abuse others, but this can be considered a contributing factor to the psychology of many of these people. With that in mind, Bryden Brunt would go on to say that his own childhood was far from ideal. He was one of seven children born to his parents. He says that his mother lived with some undiagnosed mental conditions, including depression, and that his father was extremely violent and would encourage his children to fight and hurt each other as entertainment. Bryden would say that as one of the youngest sons in the family, he always came off second best in these fights. He also alleged that his father's form of discipline was extremely violent, and he would use a large stick to beat his children after tying them to a chair so that they couldn't move. There was also domestic violence between Bryden's mother and father, which the children regularly witnessed. Bryden also said that when he turned 10, his second oldest brother began to sexually abuse him, and his oldest brother forced the younger boys in the family to commit acts of incest with their sisters. The family was isolated from others, and the children were allegedly not allowed to make friends with other children outside of the home. This last element is not uncommon in very abusive households. The abusers want to keep what's happening quiet and maintain control, so they will limit any interaction with the outside world. In some cases, we've seen children being taken out of school completely to avoid any chance that someone from outside the family might pick up on the abuse. The Brunt children, though, were still going to school, but it seems that soon the Departments of Welfare did pick up that something was not right in the family, and several of the children were removed from the care of their parents. Bryden Brunt was removed from his parents' care and sent to what is called an industrial school. Such schools were, at the time, run by the Department of Education. 
They were essentially a combination between reformatories and residential schools for children who could no longer remain in their parents' care. And at the time that Brunt was sent there, there was no distinction between children who'd been sent to the school because they were youthful offenders who could not be sent to adult prisons, and the children who simply found themselves without caregivers. This would change later in South Africa's history when it became clear how toxic this environment was for all concerned. But when Bryden Brunt was sent to industrial school, he was attending with boys who'd been convicted of a variety of crimes, including violence and sexual assaults. Clearly, this is never a good idea, as children who've come in with no criminal tendencies will likely leave with some, and those who are already violent may find a whole pool of new, young, unsuspecting victims. With this being a residential setting, where the boys were also living in dormitories on the premises, the risk for abuse from fellow students only increased, and this was what Bryden claimed he experienced there. He said that he was repeatedly raped while attending the school, and this abuse only stopped when he completed grade 10 and requested to join the army. The request was granted, and Bryden Brunt became a soldier in the SANDF. Bryden claimed that during his time in the army, he served in the military police force, which was responsible for overseeing other soldiers and investigating crime and disciplinary issues within the Departments of Defence. It's not uncommon for serial offenders in other countries to have once held a position within a police force or some sort of security job. We see this quite regularly with American serial killers, but it's not nearly as common with South African serial killers. But this may just be because the educational and job opportunities presented to South Africans are vastly different. Where we have seen South African serial killers presented with an opportunity to engage in a profession involving power and control, such as law enforcement, they have almost always taken it. We don't know why Bryden Brunt left the SANDF, where, for a man with only a grade 10 education and a spotty history, He was in a pretty comfortable position as an MP, but by 1984, when he was 20 years old, he was unemployed and getting ready to start his life of crime. In March 1984, Brunt was arrested and convicted on a charge of crimen injuria. Crimen injuria is a crime under South African common law, which is defined as an act of, quote, unlawfully, intentionally, and seriously impairing the dignity of another, end quote. The crime is usually used in the prosecution of certain instances of road rage, stalking, racially offensive language, emotional or psychological abuse, and sexual offences against children. It's unknown the exact nature of Brunt's offence, but he was given a four-month suspended sentence for that. In October of 1984, Brunt was arrested and convicted for stealing jewellery. His sentence was an interesting one, and it's actually the first time I've come across it in my research, so I looked into it a bit deeper. For his crime, Brunt was sentenced to caning. Prior to 1995, South Africa allowed corporal punishments as a sentence for both juvenile and adult offenders. This punishment was handed down only to male offenders and was referred to in case law as whipping. Offenders who'd been found guilty of a non-violent offence, who otherwise had a clean record, would often be handed down a judicial corporal punishment sentence. Juveniles were to be caned with their clothing on, while in some cases adults were ordered to remove their pants. Sentences could either involve light or heavy caning, depending on the offence. Offenders could not be sentenced to caning if they were found to have a mental disorder or, quote, psychopathic personalities, end quote. In 1995, after apartheid had fallen and the constitution had been formulated, whipping was deemed a violation of human rights by the constitutional court, 
and it was abolished as a form of punishment. Of course, today we know that corporal punishment for offenders has absolutely no corrective value, and that was very clear in Brunt's case as he went on to offend again the very next year. In 1986, he was given a three-month suspended sentence or a fine of 300 rand for stealing a bicycle. Up until this point, he'd been living in the Kronstadt area of the Free State where he'd grown up. But in 1987, he moved to the Eastern Cape with one of his brothers. If a new province was intended to be a fresh start for the young man, that soon went out the window, as within weeks of arriving, he was fined 50 rand for assaulting someone with a brick. The following year, he was issued with another 100 rand fine for malicious damage to property when he broke a mirror in a hotel room he was occupying. In 1989, Brunt was pulled over while driving drunk and sentenced to a 250 rand fine or 50 days in prison. All of this criminality was building, and Brunt was getting off with pretty light and inconsistent sentences for all of these crimes. But it would be in that same year, when he was 25 years old, that he would escalate to the ultimate crime. Research has shown that most serial killers start their crimes in their mid to late 20s, so here at least, Brunt was following the trend when on the 9th of December 1989, he went to Palmerston Nightclub and met a sex worker named Jean Natlazo. Brunt and Jean chatted for a while, and then they agreed to go to a nearby municipal building to exchange sex for payment. Brunt claims that when the act was complete, they'd argued over how much money Jean was due, and he'd become enraged and stabbed her to death with a knife. This is quite a common story for serial killers to use when their victims are sex workers. It's very likely a lie, though, because more often than not, sex workers will ensure that their customers agree to and usually pay them before the sex act, knowing full well that once the transaction has taken place, it's far too easy for the customer to refuse to pay. Usually what happens in these murders, if it has not been pre-planned, is that a killer will demand other acts from the sex worker, which she is not comfortable with, or insist on another transaction, and when the woman refuses, that is when the rage sets in. We don't know whether Brunt had taken Jean there that night to kill her. It's entirely possible. But either way, this first murder was the bitter taste he needed to introduce him to a whole different type of criminality. Of course, it certainly didn't help matters that Jean's murder didn't even seem to make a blip on the radar of the community. Nobody really seemed too concerned that a sex worker had been murdered. And Brunt perhaps realised he'd found the perfect victim pool. When Jean's body was discovered the next day, she was naked from the waist down and lying on her back on the stairs of the municipal building. The autopsy would show severe lacerations to her vagina, which may have been indicative of rape with a foreign object. Around this time in his life, Bryden Brunt had been involved with a religious group which also promoted a racist agenda. He would later attempt to claim that he'd been ordered to kill Jean by this group. Jean's murder would remain unsolved for eight years. Clearly, the murder had awoken something within Brunt that could now not be silenced. And just a month after that murder, he once again approached a group of sex workers at a bar. On the 5th of January 1990, Brunt visited the station bar. There he met Sari Skuman and two of her friends. After several drinks, he and the three women got into his vehicle and drove to Marine Drive, where they pulled over at some roadside tables and sat discussing a possible exchange of sex acts for money. Brunt had decided that Sari would be the one he wished to engage with, and with the price determined, 
they got into his car, leaving the other two women at the table on the roadside. Sari's two friends later recall seeing the car driving away, up Marine Drive, and then, a short while later, Brunt's car passed them again, except this time he was alone in the car, and there was a dent in the car's bumper. Concerned about their friend, the two women started walking up Marine Drive. Soon they found Sari's body on the side of the road in some shrubbery. Sorry had a head injury, which a pathologist would later determine had been caused by a blow from a rock, and her skull had been fractured. While this had been her cause of death, she had clearly endured significant horrors prior to passing away. When Sorry's friends found her, a wine bottle had been inserted into her vagina. Dr. Gerard Labaskakni published a dissertation regarding foreign object insertion in sexual homicides in 2007. In the paper, he notes that foreign body insertion is actually very rare, and when it's seen in a crime scene, it's indicative of a sexually motivated crime and can also become a signature in serial homicides. Foreign object insertion is considered when it occurs in any orifice of the victim's body, including the mouth. But in such cases, it's important for an investigator to consider whether placing an object in the mouth had a practical motive, such as to gag or suffocate the victim, as if this is the case, it may not be sexually motivated. It's often possible to gauge during autopsy whether an item was placed into a body pre- or post-mortem, and that can tell investigators a lot about the offender and their psychology too. In serial murders, foreign object insertion can be used as similar fact evidence to tie homicides together because it is so rarely seen. When objects are inserted into victims, this is considered to be an expression of rage on the part of the offender, with this rage being a type that they live with on an ongoing basis and find ways to express, rather than rage which is triggered by a specific action of a victim. Foreign object insertion is also one of the behaviours that may be exhibited by sexual sadists. Sadism is a paraphilia, or a disordered and harmful sexual behaviour, in which the offender receives sexual gratification from inflicting pain on a person who is not consenting to the act. Labaskakni points out that a few definitions and typologies for serial murder include foreign object insertion as a classification point for a disorganised offender, which in his opinion is not always the case. A disorganised offender usually does not show much planning in their crimes, and most murders of this nature are committed on the spur of the moment, and quite a lot of evidence is left behind. But it's also possible for an offender to shift between the two typologies of disorganised and organised, and for the foreign object insertion to become part of the plan. This seems to be what may have happened with Brunt. While his first murder does seem to have been spur of the moment, his second victim, Sari, seems to have been far more targeted. If his first crime did involve foreign object insertion, as the autopsy seemed to suggest, Brunt removed the object. Perhaps it could have tied him to the scene. But by the time he committed his second murder, he used an object he could leave behind, indicating perhaps that foreign object insertion had become part of his fantasy and part of the plan. When Sari's two friends found the woman's brutalised body, they were so shocked by what had been done to her that they removed the wine bottle from her body. A relationship of mistrust between police and sex workers has always existed in almost every country in the world, and as a result, most crimes against sex workers are not reported. Not only do they not feel they'll be taken seriously, but they're also afraid that they will be arrested if police find out they're sex workers. After removing the wine bottle, Sari's friends, knowing that she was dead and there was nothing more that could be done for her, 
fled the scene and did not alert police. Sorry's body would be discovered again later on by homeless persons in the area and police would be alerted at that time. When police arrived on the scene, Sorry had been dragged much further into the bush area and a stick had been inserted into her vagina. Bryden Brunt had returned to Sari's body after her friends had fled. Annoyed that they had disturbed the scene, he put her body in his car and drove around with her for some time. Then, he returned to where he'd originally killed her, placed her deeper into the bushes, and inserted a stick into her vagina. Clearly, the foreign object insertion had become a vital part of Brunt's fantasy, so much so that when his scene was disrupted, he took the risk of recreating it the way he wanted it. Sorry's two friends were located and interviewed. They were given assurance that their sex work would not cause legal trouble for them if they just provided police with the information they had, and they agreed. Unfortunately, the description of the offender did not bring police any closer to finding Brunt, and Sorry's murder was not linked to genes at this time. Bryden Brunt had gotten away with murder, again. In 1991, South Africa was just on the cusp of a wave of serial homicides, which would initially bring the country to its knees, but also then necessitate the forming of some of the world's best serial homicide investigation units. Serial linkage was not a big catchword for investigators back then, and of course, both Sari and Jean had been engaged in an industry which sadly sees many homicides among its participants every year, and most are not solved. Even in non-serial murders where sex workers are victims, the crimes are often difficult to solve unless DNA is available, as these murders go against the grain in that offenders are usually strangers to the victims. At this time in South African history, we were also far from regularly using DNA as a tool, so it's unknown whether rape kits were even taken from these two women. In 1991, Bryden Brunt finally did serve jail time, but it wasn't for the crimes he'd already committed. In that year, he committed a violent house robbery and almost killed the homeowner in the process. He was charged with housebreaking and attempted murder and served five years in prison. When he was released in 1996, he moved into a boarding house in the Eastern Cape. Upon his release from prison, Bryden Brunt had somehow managed to reinvent himself and convinced people around him that he was a private investigator. Perhaps using his experience in the military police, he got a job working as a bodyguard for a local doctor. He would later claim that this doctor had requested he carry out a hit on two people. Brunt claimed that he turned down the job and inexplicably, instead, offered the two people he was supposed to assassinate a place to stay. The woman, named Julia, and her boyfriend, who'd allegedly been his targets, became his roommates. But he said he'd soon kick the boyfriend out, because the man was not hygienic. What's interesting to me is how, when Brandt tells his story, he so often paints himself in the saviour role. First, he's housing people he was asked to kill, and then he claims that in December 1996, he saved a young boy whose father was abusive. He says the child had wanted to run away, and Brunt instead told him to come and live with him. With the boy and Julia, his would-be hit, now living with him, space was at a premium and he said that the child slept in the bed with him and Julia. On the 9th of December, though, he claimed that he and the boy had been asleep when Julia had come to bed drunk. He said he'd asked her to sleep elsewhere and she'd refused, and they'd gotten into a fight. Brunt would allege that during the fight, Julia had fallen, broken her neck, and died. 
An unidentified woman's body actually was discovered in 1996 in a green bin liner behind the Feather Market Hall. The case had remained unsolved, though. I think, considering his history so far, it's highly unlikely that Julia died as a result of an accident, and she was undoubtedly Brunt's third murder victim. The young boy Brunt referred to was never identified, and he soon left the man's care, according to him. But one can only imagine what the child may have witnessed that night. And indeed, I have to wonder if the boy himself actually made it out of Brunt's home alive. Perhaps admitting to a child murder would have been a stretch too far for Brunt, but I don't think it would have been impossible for him to carry out. By September 1997, Brunt had moved boarding houses again and was sharing a room with a 52-year-old man named Glenton Dean Morris. It seems that by this time, Brunt had yet not slipped back into his, his sex worker murder series. His murder of Julia seemed slightly different in nature, but he likely got as much of a release from it as he had from his other murders. It's not uncommon for serial killers to be caught in a really weird way that's not in any way related to their initial series. Some get pulled over in traffic for speeding. Others trip themselves up by sending communication to police or journalists or calling in to news stations. For Brunt, his undoing would come from that deep anger he seemed to house inside of him. When he killed his initial victims, that rage exhibited itself in foreign object insertion. But on one night in December 1997, a year after he'd murdered Julia, that rage surfaced again, and it would result in him finally being brought to justice. By the 17th of December 1997, Bryden Brunt and his roommate Glenton Morris had become good friends. Well, really, their friendship seemed to revolve more around drinking than anything else, but they certainly got along when alcohol was involved. That night, though, things went very wrong when the two men began to argue over money. Brunt claims that Morris attacked him with a shifting spanner. This detail would never be corroborated, and it sounds awfully familiar to many other serial killer stories in which there is so often the aggrieved party just defending themselves. Brunt claims that when he defended himself against Morris, he ended up strangling the man to death. This is now the third method of killing Brunt has used. With Jean, he used a knife. With Sari, he bludgeoned her to death with a rock. We don't know for sure what the cause of death was in Julia's case, but he'd said she'd broken her neck and perhaps that occurred during a method of manual strangulation, like he did with Morris. Also, you don't strangle someone to death in self-defense. It takes at least four to five minutes to actually kill someone by strangling them. It takes a much shorter period of time to have them first become unconscious, but they're not dead at that point. And if it was truly self-defense you would then either flee or leave the person alone when they were unconscious, long before you actually killed them. I can still buy self-defense by means of blunt force trauma, or shooting, or even stabbing. But strangulation? I don't know so much, Bryden. After killing Morris, Brunt cut up the mattress he'd killed him on, perhaps to hide evidence, and then dumped the pieces as well as Morris's body into a large dustbin which stood outside the boarding house. Now this scene most certainly depicts the characteristics of a disorganised offender. He actually did very little to hide his crime. In fact, although he was covered in blood, he didn't even change his clothing before leaving the boarding house. Other residents of the boarding house had heard the altercation, 
and when they investigated, they found Morris's body in the dustbin just outside and called police. Police found Brunt walking the streets in his blood-soaked clothing and arrested him. On the 22nd of September 1997, he made a full confession to a magistrate and surprised police by telling them about his other murders. Up to this point, they had no inkling that he was responsible for any other murders, and they had nothing to tie him to those murders. As both parties were intoxicated, he might actually have been able to get away with a relatively light sentence for Morris's murder, but it seemed he found the limelights all too alluring. In addition to the murders of Jean, Sari, Julia and Morris, Brunt also confessed to a fifth murder. He claimed that after he was released from jail in 1996, he killed another sex worker and left her body in Donkin Park. Police were unable to verify this murder and no record of a body being found there around the time he claimed could be found. To be honest, on this at least... I tend to believe Brunt. After all, poor record-keeping for the murder of a sex worker would not be unheard of. And he did seem to go on for an awfully long time between Julia and Morris's murders without killing, so that fifth murder would make more sense. Unlike many other serial killers, Bryden Brunt did not retract his confession when it came to his trial. If he had it's unlikely he would have been found guilty for the other murders, but he was charged with Jean, Sari, Julia and Morris's murders, and he pleaded guilty in May 1999. He was handed down four life sentences. In the run-up to the trial, during his psychiatric assessment, Brunt would reveal much of the detail about his childhood I've included here. He would also go on to claim that his oldest brother, who he accused of having been involved in sexual abuse and incest in their family home, had been diagnosed as a psychopath. The assessments of Bryden himself showed that he had many characteristics of a person with antisocial personality disorder, which is certainly not uncommon for serial killers and violent offenders in general. Some of the major characteristics of antisocial personality disorder include a lack of remorse and an incapability of taking responsibility for your own actions. Something Brunt told psychiatrists about his childhood would also put his retellings of the rest of his murders into perspective. He claimed that when he was a child, he had accidentally strangled baby chickens. Now, sure, you might as a child accidentally suffocate a small animal if you hold it too close or incorrectly, but the animal's going to struggle, and you're going to know what that means, because it's a basic fight for survival. Also, you're not going to accidentally do that multiple times. But this type of contradictory story and barefaced lie would crop up very often in Brunt's retelling of his murders which again has to make us wonder about what he says happened in his childhood. This ability to tell wild tales and expect people to believe you is a hallmark of psychopathic behaviour. Essentially, they don't care if, if what they're saying doesn't make sense to you. They feel that you have no other choice but to believe them, because they are who they are. A perfect example of this was when Brunt told investigators about a time he'd assaulted his girlfriend because she'd sworn at her son. Here he is clearly trying to show that he's the saviour. From his other stories about saving the runaway, he seems to enjoy presenting himself as a protector of children. But later, when police asked him about the foreign object insertion into his victims, Brunt denied the acts and said that he would never hurt a woman. This despite him just having confessed to killing at least three, possibly four, women. The mind boggles. But if we could understand it, that may be more concerning 
than the fact that we can't. Another major theme in Brunt's discussion of his crimes was religion. He constantly claimed that he had been influenced into killing by religious groups he belonged to, or that he'd once been a member of what he called satanic cults. But then he claimed he'd become a born-again Christian. Whenever he referred to religion, though, it was more in the sense of what a good person he was because he claimed to be a Christian, and not at all to do with any relationship he may have with the higher being. He said things that totally flew in the face of what he was confessing to. Like, I don't believe in conning the public. I love to sing and give sweets to little children. I just want to make people happy. Or kill them, you know, either one. Sorry, that was me, not him. He also said, My heart goes out to all the men and women who've been rejected by their loved ones without reason, to the women who have to take so much from their cowardly men, while there are so many men who will still love and comfort them, of which I am one. Um, I think your victims may disagree. But the crowning glory on Brunt's psychopathic statements to police was, maybe I'm too sensitive, too lovable, and too protective. I just can't. Bryden's crimes show why it is sometimes so difficult to solve serial murder cases, because for the most part, they are stranger murders. What got him caught was killing someone he knew, and who everyone else knew lived with him. Despite Brunt's disorganized nature, because of the victim profile he was selecting, there's a very good chance he may have remained at large for a very long time and been able to accumulate many victims before he was caught. In fact, it may have only been interacting with the same sex worker twice, or DNA, when technology caught up, that would have got him. I don't know why it bothers me so much when serial murderers purposefully select vulnerable victims and get away with it for so long. It's almost like an indictment on us as a society, because these predators are so skilled at watching and measuring up human reactions that they've already figured out who they can target without most of us even blinking an eye. Why do we put human lives on a scale of importance in such a way that people who seek to take lives use our own prejudices against us? So not only are these men and women who work in the sex industry being discriminated against and abused simply on the basis of the work they do, but they're also targeted for violence because of that discrimination. Serial killers targeting sex workers is not nearly as common here as it is overseas, and that in itself tells a story, because we have a far larger population of people who are vulnerable because of their socioeconomic status. But really, any single group of people being targeted because their murder will essentially go unnoticed is a direct reflection on us as a society. Although police will almost always respond to murder series with the same amount of resources, regardless of the victim profile, as we clearly saw in this case, when vulnerable victims are involved, series often aren't identified right away which means far more people from that segment of the population will die before a series is identified. In one case I covered over on Patreon, 16 sex workers were killed over a two-year period before a series was identified. I can guarantee you that if it was university students being targeted, they definitely would not have been 16 killed, before anyone identified a series. And yes, we can blame SAPS's own discrimination against victims as much as we like. And the fact that these are stranger murders does make it more difficult to solve. 
But the truth is that if we as a public made a noise about every single murder of a sex worker that happens and goes unsolved, they would have no choice but to look at them harder. So really, while we didn't ask Bride and Brunt to kill, we certainly pointed him in the direction where he would have the most success in his horrendous endeavours. Jean Natlazo Sari Skuman Julia Glenton Morris and the fifth unidentified victim. I'm sorry. Rest gently. Thank you for listening to episode 84, The Serial Crimes of Bride and Brunt. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Lived Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.